we have bad news for you. Nothing has changed. Every so often, we have reported dramatic arrests of traffic police officers caught collecting bribes on our roads, from the highways, or just about anywhere there is a road to the offices. Today, this has become a common news item. Nothing is shocking anymore. Money comes in many denominations, pressed down and shaken together. The risk of being run over by speeding vehicles in pursuit of the bribe, or as it's commonly known as chai or soda, doesn't deter them. It doesn't matter how money is presented, as long as it's money, the rest are just details. The driving force is minting as much as the pockets or the police cap can hold. Cameras have captured officers soliciting for sweeteners at every possible angle. The naming and shaming has been done, but with every passing day, it seems some traffic police officers are either brazen in the excessive behavior of breaking the very law they're supposed to uphold, or they simply don't care, or both. There appears to be a very good reason for this, or perhaps an excuse. Kenyans are willing to give bribes. And many officers are also willing to take the bribe. Despite the ESCC forming a team of investigators to deal with the bribe takers, the NTSA attaching its officers with the traffic police department to kill the lucrative business, even the formation of a police anti graft wing. The bribery spectacle Kenyans have been accustomed to on our roads has not changed much. Urban tales around this vice have gone as far as to provide dark comedy. It's even a joke uh, that is made many times that uh, of this police officer who goes to his house and the wife tells him that there is no ugali and there is no skuma. And he jokes, he tells the wife, you put the uh, maji on the fire, I'll be back in a few minutes. And within no, no time he comes back with the ugali and uh, a kilo of meat. So it is easy to go out there and collect a, 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 a bribe. There is a level to which credence in the police service has fallen to the point where the interaction between a motorist in a private or public vehicle and a traffic police officer is almost predictable. For many, whether a traffic offence has been committed or not, being stopped by a traffic police officer is just terrifying. When a crime is committed, you run to the police. When you are under threat, you run to the police. When somebody steals from you, you run to, from, you know, run to the police. So if the police were to do these things that we are talking about, who will the public run to? And that's where many Kenyans feel held hostage. Breaking the law and paying for it is not debatable morally or legally. But when the enforcer of the law conspires to defeat the same by soliciting for inducements to subvert justice, then it's an issue that's beyond integrity and corruption. It's impunity on steroids. This famous video footage that went viral in 2010 shows a sting operation by Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission on traffic police officers attached to the Lari police station in central Kenya. Four officers were arrested after being caught soliciting for bribes from Matata operators along the Nairobi Nakuru Highway. 
The officers were tracked for over a month. The old trick in the book that is common practice was used. Ask for the driving license, move to the front or behind the vehicle, remove the money, pocket and then return the driving license with no inspection of vehicles. On the day of their arrest, 18,100 shillings was found in their pockets and stashed in other places. Gladys Rotich, whose dramatic run ended in court, was found with 3,450 shillings from various motorists as inducement not to charge them with unspecified traffic offences. Together with the other three officers, James Gatitu, David Ruto and James Wahome, they were charged under the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act of 2003. The money was collected and concealed in this pickup owned by one of the officers tucked away near a bush, not far from the collection point, the roadblock. But there was something else. The police officers were not acting alone. Watch closely. The men roasting maize at the bus stop not far from the roadblock are not just minding their business. They are part of the police business. And this happens in many places. They are part of a counter-surveillance group that works with the police around the areas where they have mounted roadblocks. Well-coordinated and strategically positioned, their job is to smell trouble and report it. Apprenticed by the police who are too busy collecting bribes, their wages are for watching their masters back. Another group joins them, hawkers. Their real job is not selling the colored yogurt and biscuits. The assignment is to peep through the windows of motor vehicles and profile passengers and report anyone or anything suspicious. It's a very cozy symbiotic relationship. These are the new methods they are bringing on board uh, to continue the, uh, with the, with the, with collecting the, the bribes such that you don't get them directly. Until this happens. <laughs> Not planning to go down alone, Gladys snitched on the other counter-surveillance group members. The hawkers and everyone else involved scattered. When talking to some of these officers, what are some of the reasons they give as to why they're receiving the bribes? The, the, the running thread is that um, if uh, the, 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 the instructions are from their bosses. Where are the loopholes? And when you put very heavy fines on traffic, according to me, then you create an opportunity for harvesting. Yes. A former traffic-based commander in Kerugoya is an example. Thomas Kerinyang was accused of soliciting a bribe of 23,000 shillings to release a vehicle which had been impounded for obstruction. He was arrested after receiving 8,000 shillings as the first installment. He was waiting for the rest when the unexpected happened. He was charged in court and later discharged from the police service. We may have to come up with uh, other good formulas. Like for example, even when you talk about instant fine, we must come up with a formula where the fines are not very, are not very high. For example, if you say obstruction is 20,000 or 15,000, a person is willing to give 5,000 so that he does not pay the 20,000 shillings. But if you say obstruction is 1,000 bob or 500 bob, the persons will pay. But then, in order also to stop the people from continuing just to pay the 500 and continue, because you say, let me overlap, I'll just pay 500, we could also come up with a system where you pay the instant fine, but the record goes into your file. So that maybe we say, if you commit that same offense, 
three times within a certain period of time, then we take away your license. It's easier said than done. But will these top junior officers like these ones who have baptized themselves in the murky waters of easy money comply? Some have the audacity to thank God for a good day's harvest. What has happened is that many officers, young officers, even those who come from Kiganjo, APTC and so on, they're asking, can I go into traffic? It sounds like it is something that changes you know, it has got some magic. The magic tricks have indeed changed. What are the new tactics that the police officers are employing in receiving bribes? Like uh, you'll find a police officer is based in Nairobi. He gives you a number, said your money to this number. It's an Mpesa shop somewhere in Busia. Although the officer is based in Nairobi, the Mpesa is in Busia. So to connect the two becomes... Uh, becomes difficult. So they are changing uh, tact uh, day by day. Uh, you'll find that um, and the, 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 you'll find that where they, uh, and observe very, very clearly, where you find a police roadblock, not very far you'll find a private vehicle parked somewhere in the bush. That is actually the bank where they keep the money. So these are some of the things they have uh, brought on board. And these monies uh, keep moving. Uh, the, you, you also have instances where as they collect, other police officers will come within no time, collect, I mean, uh, remove the money from there so that uh, in the event ESEC strikes, there will be no evidence. Police have quickly moved from traditional bribe-taking methods and invented new ways to reap maximum benefits. It is social rot. It's immoral. Number one, you know, these policemen don't come from the tree. Policemen are born the same way Okaro is born. Policemen have been brought up by parents. But let us accept that our society, the level of morality has gone down. And down is the new trend. The police batons or swagger sticks have found a new use. Our investigations reveal officers sticking chewing gum at the end of the baton and using the gum to collect money dropped by motor vehicles. It saves time and is less detectable to anyone not keen on their body movement as they slightly bend to pick up the money. Motorists who are willing bribe givers don't have time to waste in obvious discussions and the police here don't want to waste that time either. It seems the new preferred method is avoiding any physical contact. Some of the officers captured in the surveillance footage show police strategically positioning themselves on either side of the road. No security checks or motor vehicle defects matter. Which place is most notorious? From Nairobi all the way to Nakuru. You find very many uh, tra traffic officers on the road and you ask yourself really what uh, are they doing on the, on, on the roads. If you move from uh, Nagin, Nairobi to Mombasa, you'll find quite a number of uh, uh, traffic uh, roadblocks. The rot is so deep that with a handful of investigators at the ESCC to conduct frequent sting operations to arrest the police across the country is not just difficult, it's wearisome. <laughs> The essence to strike fear among officers by exposing them is not making them back down. It has only opened another door to develop new tactics, even dangerous ones. Last year in, Ma, in Machakos, where we arrested some traffic officers, and within no time, their colleagues came and rescued them using force and guns and, and all that. Even when we undertook uh, an operation in, uh, in uh, Nakuru, we saw that um, the traffic officers, after that operation, they were armed. And uh, you, know, you can imagine traffic officers uh, carrying uh, weapons. So we complained to the IG at the time, and uh, that uh, did uh, change. We undertook another operation in the Weybridge, Mombasa, where actually our officer, op 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 fire was opened on our officers. Things have become tough, even for the employer. It is true, 50 shillings multiplied by 
100 vehicles that may have dropped that money ends up being a lot of money in a day. And if that money is banked at the end of the month, it's a huge sum of money. But I'll tell you, what we discovered as a commission is if we see that supervision is not um, very tight, some people up there in the police service are benefiting. What leads us to that? Why will a junior police officer on a daily basis or a weekly basis be transmitting money through M-Pesa to their seniors? What are they paying for? Are they paying for loyalty? <laughs> that is, we are loyal to you. Are they saying, safeguard my position so that I'm always here to benefit you? That practice is what really makes it difficult for that uh, process um, that eventually ends up in a very corrupt you know, display. When Matthew Itaire replaced Major General Hussein Ali in late 2009 as the 10th police commissioner since independence, he said that reforming the traffic department will be his priority. His argument, deploy the GSU on roads to contain corruption. The decaying stench of corruption in the system overwhelmed him. He didn't manage to change much. In his departure, Itaira said, I have done the best given the kind of environment I was operating in and meager resources. December 2014, former Deputy Inspector General of Police Grace Kaindi joined the fight and shut down the entire traffic base in Kabete Police Station. Even though the move was somewhat controversial, all the 22 officers were transferred across the country. The plan didn't work. It was just a transfer of a problem. A year later, in July 2015, she said the traffic department was giving the Kenya police a bad name because of corruption. If the National Police Service Commission improves the, their terms in terms of increasing their salaries, do you think it will stop the corruption on the roads? That has to be supported with another mechanism because... Uh, it has become like a tradition. You have to go on the road and collect money. So irrespective of your salary, the temptation to be on the road will be there. It's not just an issue of salary alone. You know, those with higher salaries may even demand higher bribes because they, ha they have higher wants for money. You know, the more you earn, the more your appetite for having money is. But... There are standard, there's, 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 there's also money that may be too little for an individual. You know, if you are paid a salary that you cannot meet your basics, then it also makes you vulnerable. A higher salary does not translate into greater professional appreciation of self. And there is no known statistics that reveal that a person who is highly paid is not corrupt. Can you honestly say that the money you've earned in your career as a police officer is genuine? Yes. It's genuine because um, I, have, I have made use of my opportunities well. The figures on how deeply corruption is entrenched in the police service is astonishing. What has been most glaring has been those officers that are unable to tell us how they have acquired what they have, be it um, landed property, permanent assets of any other nature, or money that they hold in accounts, or money they are, trans they are transmitting through other accounts, including the M-Pesa platforms, this has been what has been most glaring. Which incident stands out for you so far? The commission was involved in vetting of senior police officers who are best in the regions. We went to Eldred. And a police officer came before us. And uh, we began the process and immediately a conversation that started very well. We talked about their professionalism, their respect for human rights. We talked about their work record. And uh, when we now touched on financial probity, and the officer halfway was explaining, he suddenly stopped and burst into tears.
No, I'm, I'm due to finish. Hmm? I'm due to finish. Oh, no, yes, um, why are you interested in the study yourself? So I get 19,000 five hundred. Yes, relax, relax. To do business with you. No, no, relax, relax, just sit up and relax. Senior Superintendent Joshua Ongoro Asato never made any withdrawals from his salary account for 17 years. I'm right, sir. Okay, I want to take you away from that line of business. The panel vetting the officer from the North Rift region was forced to take a break from vetting him. The officer was inconsolable. It surprised us because we couldn't understand what the problem was. And he cried for quite some time. Um, what had happened is that um, we had seen huge sums of money being deposited in that officer's account, but nothing was being withdrawn for many years. And we are trying to ask the officer, how do you live? On what do you live? If all this money is just piling in your account and uh, we don't see it being withdrawn, we don't see, uh, we, we, the, the sources particularly were unclear. How much money was it? Um, it was um, close to six, seven, or eight million. I cannot remember. He actually said he was saving all his money. But he did not say it at that time. We removed him from the service. An officer attached to the Maria Kani Way Bridge of the rank of senior superintendent was found with a total of 7,735,625 shillings in M-Pesa transactions in 17 months between 1st January 2013 and 31st May 2014. A chief inspector in the same position in the same period as his senior was found with 951,550 shillings in M-Pesa transactions. A police constable in Lolongo received 3,145,119 shillings in just three months. Many other constables from Lolongo Police Station, whom we cannot name because of ongoing investigations, were found with M-Pesa transactions between 200,000 shillings and 1.5 million. Many of the officers implicated in transacting huge sums of money through the M-Pesa platform, especially at the Mariakani and Lolongo Way bridges, were off the rank of police constable. Movement of not less than 70,000 shillings in a period of three months was analyzed by investigators. 28 police officers whose M-Pesa accounts have been investigated were found to have transacted a staggering 18,363,759 shillings. This is just two police stations. In other parts of the country, the figures are not any different. Busia, Siaya, Nakuru, Kisi, Turkana, Kirinyaga, Garissa, Meru and Kajado. The picture is similar. Our investigations reveal a police constable in Machakos made the highest amount, 6,817,447 shillings in eight months. In Nairobi, another police constable had transacted 3,145,119 shillings through mobile money transfer in a period of three months only. If an officer uh, is able to bank in excess of 2 million shillings, and the only business is broilers, a hundred of them, then there is something else that is happening. So suddenly we thought, and especially those who are related to very sensitive jobs, traffic, or who are at the border points, and, or who are doing uh, work that uh, normally is not easy to account, that's where some of the money was coming from. Senior Superintendent of Police Joshua Ongoro Asato who was removed from the service for failing to explain how he never made any withdrawals from three bank accounts since 1999, appealed to the vetting panel to reverse the unfair decision. He later explained how he met his daily expenses without touching the millions in his accounts. I've not been withdrawing my salary because when I need food, I tell my wife to send me food through Transline, Easy Coach. I come from Kosele, so. My wife to Yugi is where we have an East Coach office, is translating. She sends me food. She sends me food, fish and, and my millet or sogam, sogam, nini, unga. I have personally passion. 
Why are you shocked at the revelations of financial impropriety in this officer's accounts in millions? Did that come as a shock to you? It came as a shock to me because, um, uh, not just to me, to all of us, because we thought that this is small fish, as Kenyans would want to call it, small fish. But uh, it's not small fish. The 50 shillings that they get uh, from motorists, and nowadays it's 200 shillings. It's not even the 50. It's 200, 1,000 shillings. Amounts to a lot of money. And uh, I would want you to put it in context and ask yourself, when a police officer has about 30 million in their account, how many Kenyans have become victims for this money to reach that, 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 that level? It's a big number. The bank account, the highest was the, what we froze the other day. That was about 27 million Kenya shillings. Uh, that was the highest amount I've seen. And this is a police officer of which rank? It's uh, the, 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 the very basic one, actually a rider. August 16, 2016, Senior Sergeant Scholastika Mudeo Mwangangi from Kakamega County made a surprising confession as she faced the vetting panel. She transacted 375,000 shillings through M-Pesa to her bosses. Much of it was to fuel their personal cars. The big one was when she couldn't explain how she moved 7.8 million money sent to her bosses, including a former regional traffic boss. When you tell me that, I just sit down as a commander. I tell my officers politely, uh, Mr. Hospital told us he has A, B, C, D. So what are we going to do to him? We discuss, the, the officers tell me, Madam, let us contribute this, this, and we give him some. The graft notoriety made a lot of police officers panic at the thought of facing the National Police Service Commission in the full glare of cameras. What was done in secret was about to come out in the open. The vetting exercise was supposed to take 18 months beginning November 2013. It has taken three years, with the vetting only taking place in eight months. We have vetted over 2,600 officers in the, of the National Police Service. That's a big number. By the time we finish with the traffic, we'll have vetted close to 4,800 officers. Out of 904 traffic police officers vetted in four regions only, 777 were successful and only 127 have been removed from the service. 26 opted not to face the vetting panel and left the service voluntarily. When the police service commission came in, there was a lot of panic within the service. Not just on vetting, but on many other underlying factors in the, within the system. Change is very painful and nobody, nobody accepts change easily. So people panic, you know, transformation is not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing because uh, this work we do is more practical. Less than 4% of the officers that we have vetted fall in the category of those that are unable to account and all those who have got integrity issues. When it came to traffic police officers, we saw more officers beyond the 4% limit. In fact, it was coming close to 13%, 13-14% who were suitable for removal. The panic wave within the police rattled senior and junior officers as the National Police Service Commission tried to bring a purge to an ecosystem that spewed anyone who was alien to it. Before we started vetting, there was huge resistance, especially from um, the more senior police officers. And uh, it was not surprising because when anything uh, comes <clears throat> about and it looks like uh, it is causing a lot of uncertainties, uh, anybody is bound to worry. So we, we thought it was very normal for the police officers to be worried about what this is all about. And the resistance was shown in many, rather was manifested in many ways. Of course, you saw the threats on our lives as commissioners. We even had um, innocent human beings 
uh, like the young man who was uh, beheaded, uh, so that um, it can show the seriousness with which police officers were fearing the vetting. Um, we had some commissioners re receiving th threats through letters. I personally received um, letters, very many of them, and uh, significant uh, the two, one which was laced with the poison. Another form of resistance is coming from an unlikely source, the justice chain. NTV Investigates has obtained court files of 109 police officers whose cases are still pending before court. This list was updated on 17th January 2017. Why don't we see results? I will give you examples because uh, one, we have um, like uh, two years ago we have arrested some traffic officers in, uh, in the cause of collecting their bribes. We took them to court. But before they could take plea, they moved to court, got, uh, filed a constitutional petition, and got conservatory orders. Two years down the line, we are still pushing for the hearing and disposal of that petition so that we can have these of police officers charged in court. But as we, as, as, as we speak, they are still on the roads, collecting bribes. That is very frustrating. Whoa. The four officers from Larry Police Station caught on camera collecting bribes in 2010 in a dramatic episode are free. Their court case is now entering its seventh year. In the meantime, they are back on the road as they wait for the appeal to be determined. It's not the only case. Uh, McQueen, we arrested the traffic officers. We found the money in, uh, in his pocket and we charged him. But uh, the magistrate uh, ruled that uh, we owe, it was our responsibility to explain how the money went into his pocket. And the case, <laughs> the police officer was uh, acquitted. The DPP has appealed that uh, decision. So there are these outrageous decisions that, that are coming from the courts uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, negate common sense. We have had officers who have been caught red-handed receiving bribes. They have been taken to court and their cases have taken a long time because of objections raised, the normal way it happens in the courts, and this has told the process of discipline. Where the discipline in the service is interfered with through judicial processes, it weakens the entire fabric of what is always seen to be a disciplined service. According to Cavaludi, Owino and Mubair, the bad news can only change if this was to happen. If an officer is caught, um, you know, receiving bribes, in the police regulations, that is the standing orders, there is punishment that can be undertaken and somebody goes through a disciplinary process and if that officer should be removed, it's removed from the service. We would like to encourage more use of disciplinary processes in the police rather than resorting to criminalizing what is a breach to police discipline. We may have to come up with uh, other good formulas. Like for example, even when you talk about instant fine, we must come up with a formula where the fines are not very, are not very high. Payment of fines is made easy and is made affordable and that will deal with the challenge of corruption within the police. In the meantime, the roads are still busy. So are the corrupt bribe givers and bribe takers. These images will stay with us for a long time. If the system doesn't change, nothing will change. Maybe tactics after this program. Dennis Okari. NTV investigates.